Worf and Beverly enjoy a nice meal at a Rudia for cafe. The Enterprise gets a carpet change. And this is the year of the Irish unification. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 3, Episode 12, The High Ground, written by Melinda M. Snodgrass, directed by Gabrielle Beaumont. If this sounds like the first time a woman has written an episode and a woman has directed an episode at the same time in a Star Trek episode, you are correct. It is the first time ever. Uh, this was January 27th, 1990. We've got a very special guest, everybody. Can you believe it? One of the most exciting and action-packed episodes ever, thanks to Danger, Dennis Madalone, a uh, legendary stuntman and stunt coordinator. How are you today, Dennis? Hey, great. Thanks so much. It's great being here. So uh, good having you again. You Welcome yeah. back. Uh, just to open this up, the rumor is that this episode came about two things. One was it was influenced by uh, the Revolutionary War, and then later it was much more about uh, the Irish uh, situation that was going on in 1989 uh, at the time, like the separation of Ireland and all that. But mainly it was that the executives said they wanted something with more action. They wanted a thriller. They wanted gunfights and laser beams and stuff like that so this episode was created so they're like all right dennis we need you <laughs> do, you <laughs> do you remember when you first saw this script or when you were approached or what your first impression was when you're like oh boy this is gonna gonna have a lot of work on this one yeah you know tng had its moments of action but uh, this one was like, all right, man, now we got something. You know, sometimes I'm on episodes where I'm babysitting just some of the actors or we're just doing one stunt. But when I read the uh, title of the script, High Ground, I said, well, I wonder what that means. And then when I read the script, I said, "This they should change the title to Hit the Ground because <laughs> it was nothing back. And so I said, oh, we got Hit the Ground, High Ground. And it was just like cool action everywhere. And I always have a great my buddies with me that are just great stunt performers and i almost got every one of them on that show because uh, there was so much different action throughout the whole episode so it was really cool to be uh uh to be on tng where there was uh, a lot more action mm -hmm. um dennis can you walk me through how what's the process of you developing uh coordination for us for stunts uh, you get the script uh and then you you kind of go through the whole thing like what's the what's the timetable involved with that what's the process like you know when i get a script uh i sometimes i skip the dialogue and i get right to finding where you know the action is uh and uh once i find the action i'll you know bend the page and make notes doubles make notes start to think of uh, visualizing who I want on the team uh, to come aboard on these particular episodes. And then I um, really do my homework and get everything off the script and on a, a stunt sheet saying, you know, scene 23, double Captain Picard, uh, blah, 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 blah. And then what I do from there is I call the director first before I call anyone. Because if I don't know what he really wants, then what I only know what I would like. And and then there's things that what the producers are thinking about. But I already know, go to the director. I call him up. We talk through the script. He goes, oh, yeah, we'll get a double from the car. And we'll get a close-up of the car throwing a punch. And then we'll have the double tackling uh, the double for that actor in that, in that scene. And we just talk it all out. So when I go to a production meeting with my stunt budget and my breakdown, every time it, the scene comes up with a stunt, me and the director are totally in sync. So when we say, yeah, we're going to have a double here and double there, the producer and Mary Howard and Brad, they all go, oh, great, great, great. And so because I learned when I was 20 years old at Universal coordinating my first show, I went to a meeting without talking to the director and there was lots of stunts in it. And I'm just a kid, right? So I'm like learning on the job how to 
you know, uh, do all this. And I'm in the meeting and uh, we get to the stunt scene and I tell the director, well, I just tell everyone in the room, the producers, everybody. I go, yeah, here we can have, you know, six cars sliding and then we can have a double. And the director, I'm waiting for the director to go, yeah, yeah. And the director goes, that's not what I was thinking. And we're like, oh, man. And then I go, uh, well, you think, well, maybe three drivers. And so he was still along with it. But I realized, wow. So after that whole episode, it went great. I said, I'm always going to talk to the director because he's the man at the meeting that nods yes. And then the producers go, OK, keep that in the budget. It's the director's vision. So since then, I always want to capture the director's vision and even give him more if he's open to it. He'll go, oh, that's even better. So it's really about getting in sync with the director and then making sure we can make budget with our producers and stuff. Um, so, Sorry, go ahead, Srock. No, I, I just had a, one little extra follow-up on that. So you meet with the directors, you, you get the budget uh, assigned, you call your guys up, and everything is going according to plan. Um, then you're... Uh, at what point do you work with other uh, with the with the effects guys for explosions and and things of that nature? Does that happen on the set at the time, or is there a pre walkthrough on where explosions are going to happen and and the directions of things? Yeah, pretty much in the production meeting. That's the first production meeting, and then there's you know another one. But in between the two is uh, the first one. You talk about everything, the effects. We were going to squib the guy for the hits, which we did a lot of squib hits on high ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then in between the gap of the two meetings, the one in the beginning and the one right before the show, like maybe a day or two before the show, we walk and talk and we'll go to the set and uh, we'll walk and find out. Uh, we'll talk to the effects guy um, if it's going to be uh, if we need his uh, squibbing to be. Uh, we talk to the director where uh, the scenes are going to be and where the actor is going to fall out of frame. So by the time we're really done prepping for seven days, the director, me and everybody else is like, all right, let's shoot because we are so in sync. We're ready to go. We talked it. We walked it. We got okay. everything lined up. We really know what we want. So when we go on the set, it's really magic. It's like just when that scene comes up, we know where the double goes in. Mm -hmm. We know uh, where the actor comes in. It's just really magic. Everything is just planned out. And then now and then when you're on the set, you ad lib. And the director will go, oh, hey, Denny, can we do this? I go, yeah, let's do it. So you got to be ready to you put together a great painting for everyone and be ready to add some more painting on it to really make it even better. So it's I love a director that comes on there. And he, he even wants more on the day. He'll come up with something. But uh, instead of, you know, you don't want a director that's taking away. Um, but uh, I'm pretty famous for uh, creating, a, you know, making, you know, getting a, what the director wants, but even more, you know, make mm -hmm. it really rich. And I remember one of my unit managers, Bobby D on D Space Nine, said to a new director that Dennis Mantle is going to give you a whole lot. You probably only need half it, you know. And he was right. I I come in with all that. Let's yeah. do a big. And uh, we're ready to give him a, a real lot. And by the time we're done prepping, we end up getting a lot of meat. But mm -hmm. I remember my unit manager that that was a compliment. But he was letting the director know, don't let Dennis give you too much, you know. <laughs> Everybody so, just uh, listening in right now, you can't yeah. see this, but Dennis is wearing an awesome Greatest American Hero long sleeve well, shirt. He's also got a picture of himself on fire behind him and another Greatest American <laughs> Hero <laughs> image behind him. Great stuff. Love the Greatest American Hero. However, can yeah. you walk us through this scene a tiny bit? It kind of opens up the episode. Beverly and Worf, for some reason, are just enjoying a cafe on a mission. And they're like, oh, yeah. we're done eating. An explosion happens. You've got three, presumably three stunt people here taking dives. Do you remember this? Yeah, I do. And uh, I remember it was me in the middle and it was Mark Riccardi wearing the helmet and it was Pat Tallman or Lynn Salvatore. They're both great stunt women. Uh, I was one or the oh, other. Is that from might be Pat Tallman. 
Yeah, I feel like it was Pat for sure. Just uh, I can remember her being there. And it was a huge explosion, uh, bigger than what they normally do. Normally we mm -hmm. do uh, something bigger than a squib hit explosion where they shoot court. But that was a pretty big one. So I remember setting it up with my guys saying that when this thing starts to go off, we have to we have to really, you know, take the hit, but close your eyes because there's a lot of debris coming. Uh, and it only takes one little something to get in your eye. And I remember the way we all flew, we were all in sync on um, flying the right way. So the debris was hitting the back of our head and the side of our face. And as we hit the ground, I remember the Mark Riccardi was wearing the helmet. So he had it made. He had a helmet and gargles playing some kind of, you know, guard. So he was yeah. wasting. But uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Wow. And then for people that can't see, even when you're doing the reenactment right now, Dennis, there's a way that you flail your body when you get hit. That <laughs> it's such it's such a performance way that is I can see the the stunt man in you ready for the camera shot because you do. I remember you saying that on on the set, uh, prepping actors for taking hits or you know to 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 kind of sell the motions here and there and you always used to give us those kinds of instructions prior to filming a scene where the actor himself was doing some minor stunt work yeah and you know what it is i just recently over the last few years i realized that when i am working with the actors and and getting them you know I, i'm like a coach you know mm -hmm. uh, pump a track kids at the, at the track field in high school because you got to pump them up, excite them, uh, make them believe, tell them how good they look in the rehearsal. You got to feed them that energy because some people are shy and they don't know if they're looking good. But I, I just feed it. I feed them and I build them up. And so every time a guest star comes on a show, I just pump them up. We rehearse and we get them going and just get them that energy. So it's always big, you know, and, and you can't overact on these shows because they're big phaser hits, you know. Right. And so I enjoyed all the challenges of all the new actors that come aboard, the guest actors, to start over, see what they have in them, see when I put the fight together, if they don't quite uh, can give us the close-up shot, I'll tweak the fight on something else they could do to fit their guest star. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a great performance all the way around. So, you know, sometimes I get an actor and he has a bad neck and so I have to tweak the fight to adjust to the actor or or they can't quite throw the punch. So I'll change it to a stomach hit, you know, because they mm -hmm. can't throw a good face punch. So it's just really, you know, yeah. doing all homework before before we step in front of the camera and then get them pumped up, you know, and also know that as much as you pump them up when you, if it's a fight scene and two actors have to throw a punch at each other. You have to keep stepping in in between takes to make sure they don't get over amp where they get too close and they mm -hmm. clobber each, you know? Hey, uh, Dennis, uh, you sent a lot of really great information. I'd love to jump on some of this. So a couple guys here. One of them looks very familiar. Does that happen to be you? And if so, <laughs> who's this guy? Is it a buddy of yours? Buddy, uh, yeah, that's me on the left side of the photo. And uh, you can always tell me, even when I'm a Cardassian or a Klingon, because I got the nice Italian nose, you know? <laughs> so I, I mean, I'm in uh, And right next to me on the picture on the right, that's Kenny Lesko. He's my best friend. We trained together when I was like 18 years old at Paul Stater's Stunt School in Santa Monica, California. And we became best friends. So when we exploded in the business, I took pretty much everyone in the gym with me, but especially him. And then he went on to stunt coordinate Pulp Fiction and all these incredible wow. features. Wow. So, so it's great when you can have your buddies with you. And what's cool about that scene is uh, Worf and Jonathan Frakes, they both jumped us from behind and beat the heck out of us. And so it's great. Yeah. When you, it's great when you can get beat up with your buddy right by your side getting beat up. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Sounds like a bar fight. <laughs> I have a, I have another question for you, Dennis. There's something that we see recurring in Star Trek, and I wanted to know if maybe you deserve the credit for inserting this particular aspect of fight choreography. The two-handed... <laughs> 
punch. We see it many times used in different cases. We saw it in an episode before this, actually. Uh, the two-handed, boom, punch. Uh, uh, Major Kira has used it before. Mm -hmm. I I've seen it used in several incarnations, and I want to know, can we credit the two-handed punch to Dennis Madelow? Um, put a hold on that. Let me tell you what I did <laughs> create. Yeah. That, I took, that I did take. Uh, uh, that they embraced was when I started doing something with Worf. I came up with the, you know, boom, the palm shot into yes. the face. He does that and, a lot. Yeah, uh, it felt like Worf. It felt more like that, you know, like a like a bear, and he looked like a bear with that Klingon gear. And and so I, and I, I think I probably back in my mind got that from a Bruce Lee thing from you know from the early seventies or something, but. And then when it, I looked at it and he was throwing it for the first time, I said, man, this is cool. I end up taking that with me on so many things. I let Cardassians use it. Other Klingon, Deep Space Nine was one of my favorite moves. And then with with um, with Nana, I uh, had her even do a strike. And then, oh, I like Nana. I created like elbow strikes with Nana and she yeah. loved it. But she looked so good at it. I made sure that when she fought, we always got elbow shots in there, you know, boom, 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 you know? Yeah. And then, yeah. but this, this thing I took when I was a little kid, five or six years old in New Jersey, I was watching the original Star Trek and William Shatner was doing some, he was beating up a big, funny looking costume alien. You could tell it was a big costume. It was, maybe it was horn. just. It looked yeah. real back then. But if you look at it now, it was just a big alien costume, like a lizard man. Mm -hmm. And out of nowhere, yeah. you know, that show was throwing punches a lot. <clears throat> so when I started doing Star Trek, I said, we're not going to do punches. This has got to be more like elbow strikes, you know, almost like karate, judo, but not the kicks to the face, not sweeping kicks to the face. I felt it was more right. like all the arm action. But when, yes. when, um, William Shatner was beating up this creature. He was throwing punches, and out of nowhere, he did the double, and then a double thing over the back of the yes. neck. And yes. the creature went down, and so I took that, and I brought that into, brought it back, because out of all the fight stuff from the original series, to me, I said, that still could be used in the future. Mm -hmm. And I used it everywhere on, on TNG and and D Space Nine and uh, Voyager. I just love the shot in the gut and over the back, you know. <laughs> it's something That's, easy yeah. to show to the actors to and get great reactions. So uh but uh yeah no I stole that from William Shatner and uh but I created the palm shot. So oh, that's interesting. Wow. That yeah, is good knowledge. Yeah it sounds like the key is you're creating things not just for stunt people but for actors that aren't necessarily trained in in stunts something like this that that's doable you're not flailing a, a a hand where you could go too far and hit clip somebody's nose or chin you're not you know throwing something you know it's like this it's a very controlled move for somebody that may not be super trained so that's really cool and interesting it's fun to know that that actually was taken from Shatner fighting the Gorn. But here's a stunt yeah. person I think you mentioned. Either that or you showed Worf, Michael Dorn, how to dive back five feet while getting shot with a phaser. <laughs> yeah, this this is, in this shot, we used uh, Michael Dorn's stunt double. His name is Rusty McLennan, a great stunt man. And um, it, Rusty, I, I love the first time I started using Rusty because the minute he flies in the air, he's just a ground eater. And I'm old school. I like getting up, eating the ground, and obviously getting up afterwards and 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 feeling feeling good. You don't want to get clocked and hit your head. So I love Rusty's talent. He's he's great. He doubled Dorn for gosh, all seven years. And you know what? A neat story about that. Rusty McLennan is uh African American. But he's really light skinned. He almost his hair was red. He mm. he almost looks like he's from Ireland, you know. <laughs> and so I brought Rusty in the double Michael Dorn for the first time, and they got him in the trailer. And Michael Dorn is like four chairs down, getting in makeup, and he, in goes Rusty, 
And he walks in and he goes, I'm the double for uh, Michael Dorn, Worf. And Michael Dorn looked at him and he saw a white guy. He he, he stormed out of the room and went right to the phone and called David Livingston. He goes, I got a white guy down here, double me. I got a white guy. So David came down and, and by the time David got there, Michael Dorn already talked to Rusty. And when Michael Rusty went up to him and said, hey, I'm Rusty McClendon. He goes, I'm Af- African-American. And he goes, what? He goes, I'm African-American. And they started jiving back. Up. He goes, oh, yeah, that. And then uh, Dorn looked at him and goes, oh, that's right. That is a fro you got. It's a red fro. <laughs> <laughs> and they just became best friends. I love and it. And they showed up like, oh, my gosh. What did you do, Dennis? I go, I didn't do nothing. I go, these guys are best friends. And he goes, oh, my God. <laughs> but it's true. That would have been a very touchy and rightfully so yeah. situation. I could totally oh, get that. Yeah. Uh, but I do well, want to follow up on this scene just a little yeah. bit more, if that's okay. Because yeah. you also sent this, which I don't think that's a stunt double. Is that a – did you teach Captain Picard how to, how to swing at somebody on the oh, bridge? I was really proud of um, – Mr. Stewart here, because he he just threw a great punch. I mean, look at him. He's leaning. He's throwing his face, the energy. Yeah. I mean, he really sold it. And that's what we do. We just get them all pumped up, tell them how good it looks. And he mm. really nailed it. That's a Chris Doyle. But when, he, when Captain Picard threw the punch from the front angle, we were on the actor's face. But they love this angle better where it was on the stunt double, which is Chris Doyle. And we see Picard throw the punch. That was the money. The minute they fly out of frame, we cut to a side shot where uh, the stunt double is throwing the punch and he land, falls right on top of the Chris Doyle's, you know, he's the double that hit the ground. And so everything just really cut together really cool uh, when you watch that episode with, with Picard. You can't really tell that he didn't, he's not the one that landed on him, you know, mm. because we did such, uh, the director did such a great job of getting a great angle, seeing Picard throw the punch and, and kind of go up in the air to cut to the two guys hitting the ground. Uh, I, I had a question also, uh, Dennis, about, you know, sometimes you get an actor that, you know, wants to do a stunt. And where is that line where you think, where you draw, where you say, you know what, we got to have the stunt guy do it. Uh, we we don't want you doing it. Uh, and sometimes there's like a bravado there. The actor wants to do it and wants to, you know, be the one doing it. Where where do you draw the line and say, no, this is this is where I, you know, like a medical doctor have to kind of override. Yeah, I never really had that issue uh, even though sometimes we don't have a double because it was just going to be a punch and then he falls out of frame into a pad i just make sure that the actor is if the actor is not the one that's going to be uh in a big explosion or he's not going to be the one that hits the ground hard i'll always shoot the he- i'll make the actor feel good he'll he'll take the punch and go out of frame and land on four pads that are like a big old bed with us mm-hmm. Out of frame, me and a few buddies spotting him so he doesn't miss the pad. And I'll yeah. get him, he sells the money shot, seeing the real actor go out of frame. And I'll let him know that now let the let our guy hit the ground because this is what he's gonna do. And the stunt man does a rehearsal, he eats the ground, and the actor usually says, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't that hard. <clears throat> so yeah. the actors will let let us get a lot of cool footage, but not let them be in, let's just say the risky spot, you know, hitting the ground because we don't want anyone hitting their head. So we just got to be, so I've never really had, uh, I've had actors on the phone before that I would call up guest stars and then they would say, Oh, I want to do my own stuff, but I always bring in a double and they always do about 40%. And then we do the rest. Okay. Hey Dennis. Wow. I just realized we only have about a minute left with you. Uh, but before we go, uh, there was also one you mentioned. This was walking through the halls. You said one of your best friends was in uh, this scene. He gets shot by one of the uh, – it's uh, Chris Doyle gets shot, blasted by the stunt woman, Denise Lynn Richards. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, her name is uh, Denise Lynn Roberts. Oh, and Roberts. she is 
He has a great stunt woman. She doubled uh, Nana a little on D Space Nine, and she worked on a lot of D Space Nine other than TNG. So she's great. I used her and Pat Tomlin a lot because they were both about the same body size. But yeah, Chris Doyle plays a uh, just an ND Starfleet guy, and he's walking. And uh, Chris Doyle is the same thing. I went to the gym with him, with Kenny Lasko and all these guys. So it's great having him in there playing himself as a Starfleet, getting shot by another stunt woman, Denise Lynn Roberts. And mm-hmm. what was really cool about um, that episode was we used Chris to play the part. There he is. And then we used him to double the actor that uh, Captain Picard built it. So he got to oh, be nice. in two spots in the same episode. Which is rare for my guys to do that, but for me, I, I sometimes I go in three or four different spots on the same mm-hmm. episode because they're different days, you know. So I was a I was a stunt hog. I loved just getting on camera yeah. everywhere. Just, just, you know, I loved performing. I loved wearing the gear, and yeah. uh, and I'm still that way, you know. Ever since I've been 18 years old, I love just going out there and eating the ground and uh, and doing cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And and we love you, Dennis. You you oh, are yeah. one of the most loved people uh, that you know I've worked with. Uh, you always bring that a quality, happy, positive, good vibration type energy on the set. The the whole pumping up the actors and making them feel good. You do that for for everybody you're around. That's infectious energy. And and really, I want to say thank you personally because it's been some. It's a real pleasure to watch you build your career and, and, and watch you work. It's, it's, it's why you keep working. Um, it's why people love you. Hey, Chirac and, um, Ryan, it's easy for me to show up and have that energy all the time because I get to show up every other day and I get to wreck the set, break things, beat people up. And afterwards I don't have to pay for anything. It's all free. I get to, <laughs> they, have, they pay us to do it. It's crazy. Uh, and so it's easy to do. come in and do the crazy fun stuff and people clap and cheer. I mean, sometimes I show up on TNG and they've been working for five days straight and overtime and it's a smoky set and they're tired. But when I show up, it's been pretty cool because it's like, oh, good. Energy goes. The whole crew is like, oh, we're going to kill someone today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No dangers there. Let's go. So it's kind yeah. of a uplift. I'm like the the candy man that shows up with the candy truck and the ice cream truck and and <laughs> you know, just so it's easy. The crew. I always look up to everyone. The crew just does. You know, they they're the ones putting in the 16 hours a day. Mm-hmm. So I always look up to them and and bring them good energy and 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 always thank them for their hard work because they're the ones that are really you know working all the time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. You're like a breath Dennis. of fresh, fresh air, Dennis. We love you, man. Absolutely. And we, we really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us. Very quickly, I do want to say that you reminded me, I did do a lot of stunts back in the day. I say back in the day, but you're, you've are you been doing them for like 30 or 40 years. But uh, And on a show I did a lot of stunts for was Deadliest Warrior. And I said the same thing you said, which is... <laughs> Uh, we're fighting, we're knights out in the mud and the rain and we're using swords and hit, just destroying each other. And I remember thinking, this is like, it's like playing with sticks in your backyard as a kid and you're destroying things and you're ruining things and you don't have to worry about anything. It's not your stuff. You, you just, you, when you're done, you take it off. They deal with broken swords and shields and <laughs> everything. It's the most fun thing. As long as you're trained, obviously, you know, huge caveat there, everybody be careful and don't do anything ridiculous. But Dennis, really appreciate you. You're always such a huge breath of fresh air. We love you and your work, and we really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for hanging out. I, I love you guys, and uh, keep having fun, okay? You know we will, with sticks in our thank backyard. You, <laughs> uh, everybody Some at home, that. Some yeah, of that. stick around. <laughs> we will be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc. Lofton. Hello, hello. Here are the trivioids of the week. God, Dennis Madalone is so freaking cool. Here they are. <laughs> Worf and Beverly enjoy a nice meal at a Rutia 4 cafe. Beverly Crusher tells Lieutenant Worf to get her something with alcohol in it. The Ancentis Separatists want to free themselves from the rule of the Eastern Continent. 
Wesley wants to go on an away mission. Strength may be useless when faced with terrorism. The Ensenta, Ensata, Ensanta, uh, Ensada, that's what it was. The Ensada <laughs> transport <Yeah. laughs> through a dimensional shift. Alexana Devos's predecessors were murdered. Uh, in a world where children blow up children, everyone's a threat. Kirill Finn should be drawing, not killing. Katik Shaw, Katik Shaw is a waiter for the Lumar Cafe. This is the year of the Irish unification. And the Enterprise gets a carpet change. Wow, that was a mouthful. A lot of names to memorize there. So real quick, yeah. just to set the stage, apparently this is the first day with a new carpet on the Enterprise, the one that they stuck with oh. for the remaining four and a half seasons. Uh, okay. This was originally written, an idea was, it was based in the Revolutionary War from Melinda M. Snodgrass, and uh, then it became more about, apparently, the Irish you know, war that was going on there and the terrorism that was going on there. That's why they mentioned in the year 2024 that they, there's an Irish unification. So look forward to that, everybody. That's going to happen this year at some point. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in history here. I was looking up some other things. There was a scene in this episode, Ciroc, that was banned yeah. in the UK because of that Whoa. Irish thing. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look up that scene. Uh, oh, here it is. Um, because it was about the IRA, right? The Irish Republican Army, the provisional whatever, right. re 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 reunification of Ireland in 2024, blah, blah, blah. But what does Data say? I don't remember exactly what he says, but he says something about that. I'll have to look it up again, but it's really interesting. Anyway, so uh, much stuff behind this one. What are your thoughts? Uh, I think it was around Data asking about the acceptability of terrorism. There was a point where he... That was exactly says, it, yeah. Yeah. I wrote that in my notes. He's, he was basically saying, you know, is it acceptable under certain conditions to. And Picard's response was pretty good, too, because he was like, well, that's what we're trying to find. That's what human civilization has been trying to figure out this whole time. When is that? Where is that line? I still haven't figured it out. And here is the quote, the, the, the full thing. Well. No, that's not it. But uh, anyway, that was exactly the scene that you're talking about, uh, Ciroc. And yeah. uh, it's really interesting because here it is. Data says, but if that is so, Captain, why are their methods so often unsuccessful? Or why are they so successful? I've been reviewing the history of armed rebellion, and it appears that terrorism is an effective way to promote political change. Picard responds, yes, it can be, but I have never subscribed to the idea that political power flows from the barrel of a gun. But anyway, that's just a small part of it. Uh, but yes, that was the scene. It was like a full minute and change that was banned in the UK starting, in, I think, 2007, something like that. I can see why, um, because it's controversial. It it almost um, excuses. It doesn't excuse, but it offers an excuse or a reason or a rationale. And we're currently, and always, I think, in a kind of cyclative way, going to be revisiting this particular subject matter. Um, it's it's in the headlines now, and I don't think it's going to be going away anytime soon. Because there's always going to be this argument about uh, oppress versus oppressor, and uh, what are the appropriate measures to take to try to affect change. Um, this episode was well written. I thought that you know this character that was played by. Uh, or this this main character who was the villain, what was his what was his name? Oh, Finn. Yeah, Carol Finn. Um, not to be confused with Errol Flynn, but uh, 
Carol Finn. Or Claire Finn. Claire Finn uh, was played by Penny Johnson Gerald. Uh, that is a the doctor on the Orville. Didn't exactly. That. Not to be confused with those. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> with any of those. <laughs> None of them. Um, but or no, Flynn I mean, Rider for you Disney fans out there. Th- th- this is, you know, you mentioned earlier about this being the first episode written by a woman and then directed by a woman. Gabrielle du- Beaumont is the first woman to direct an episode of Star Trek. I think I worked with her on Deep Space Nine as well, because when I looked her up, she did come, my, it was familiar to me, uh, having interacted with her. Um, but Melinda Snodgrass is an exceptional writer that is just, you know, she yeah. does what I think Star Trek is really best at, and that is taking very relevant, real headlines and making them and adapting them into a future tense into a science fiction tense and you know because themes are are always going to be around it's it, it's it's practical and it also makes us relate to it when you watch it you're like oh this is something that i can identify with thematically because it's something that has either happened in in recent history or um is currently happening yeah and uh another great thing about melinda and i kept thinking about how great she is the directing was great uh also to complete the trifecta uh the female lead uh in this uh you know in this episode or i could say you know besides beverly crusher but the female guest star is more what i mean was you know she's like the leader of the military and it's and it's also a lady right and then you have beverly yeah. crusher doing her thing and it was just very woman centric female centric and they're all killing it in their roles every single one of them the writing the directing the acting but yeah. uh the great thing about melinda you can tell she's an attorney right because in every episode we've seen what does she do she presents arguments from all angles yes you know but what yes. she what she did not do in this episode was provide an answer or a solution. In the measure of a man, she gave all points, but then she kind of gave a conclusion that data is a sentient human, like that, right? And in previous episodes, she does such a great job. That's what attorneys do. They have to be able to argue something they agree with. They also have to be able to argue something that they vehemently disagree with just because that's their job. And so she's able yeah. to present both sides of an argument. Uh, and it really makes for compelling television to be able to do that because if you're only presenting one side, it's it's fine, it's cool, could be fun or interesting. But this really makes you think when she does that. Yeah, and when I when I find myself writing down lines of an episode, like literally recopying lines constantly, yeah, that's when I know it's it's well written. Because otherwise, I just you know, I'm like, oh, I'll write down a theme, I'll write down a performance, I'll talk about the the framing of the direct the shot. I might think about other aspects or even the music, but when I'm actually writing down the words, yeah. because I think the words are resonating and they they ring true to me. Um, that's when I think, oh, this person who's writing this episode has hit a nerve where I feel um, compelled to rewrite the words that they wrote. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, this episode was laced with great performances. I, I you know, Beverly gave some amazing performances yeah. in the sense. Uh, Gates McFadden was exceptionally good in this episode. I, you know, have a whole kind of different respect for how good she is as an actor. Um, and the other thing that other person that I thought had a great moment, and maybe not necessarily the whole time I really liked this performance, but the this window was really good. And that's the 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 general or commander uh, character in this episode who's pursuing all of the terrorists you know in this episode yeah her name is alexana 
uh, whatever it was. <laughs> That's the there, character name, or yeah, Alexana uh, Devos. That was the character, the character name. name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what the the scene that I thought she just killed was the scene with her and uh, Riker, right? When Riker says, "Is that what you want?" And then she goes into Agreed. what I want, and then she goes into the is to go home, back to my own country, you know, to believe to leave behind the roundups, the interrogations, the bodies lying in the street. That's Melinda Snodgrass killing it to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had to write all of that stuff, so, and the performance was equally as good as the verbiage, in my opinion, because she was standing strong to Riker. And the way she closed it off with, that's what I want, Riker. The way she said it um, was just, it, it came from a very genuine place to me. And I thought it was super well delivered. Yeah, I agree. I really liked that scene very much. And that was Melinda Snodgrass all over. You know, when she says, I considered myself a moderate. And he says, what changed your mind? And she says, being here for six months, watching the body count grow, the three assassination attempts on my life. And he goes, well, that'll change your point of view. By the way, I saw a couple Riker maneuvers when he was fighting and swinging. <laughs> he was like fixing yeah. his shirt. But then he, and then she says, uh, terrorist bomb blew up a school, killed 60 children. And Sada said it was an accident. Uh, but there was, but there was a lot of gray. I mean, this is what, this is what she does, Melinda. She doesn't just point out every angle of everything, but it leaves you basically saying well now i'm just sitting here in the gray area which is yes. what life is life is not black and white life is not a one or a zero life is everything that happens in the gray area and she really leaves us there uh me too i wrote down a million lines <laughs> i wrote down too many notes for this one it, it was just too much and then even the idea that uh when they captured Picard, and one of his demands was uh, when he pops up and tells Troy, uh, I tell him I want an uh, economic embargo. I want a full blockade. Um, it, these are actually real life uh, mechanisms that are used in order to inflict punishment on governments, on countries. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that was also resonated with me as well. The fact that it wasn't just a terrorist saying, and I want a helicopter and I want a million dollars in uh, in gold bricks. You know, this wasn't like something that you argue for, for, you know, some material thing. This was like a real kind of... Uh, impactful way to impose suffering on this country. So I, I thought that was also uh, a nail hit on the head by Melinda Snodgrass. Yeah, I agree. And uh, actually, there was one other point totally different, which was when they think they might die. Beverly says, Jean-Luc, there are some things I have to tell you. She gets here. She calls him Sean Luke, not Captain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she caresses his ear. Maybe she didn't do that, but I, that's what I pictured. Uh, <laughs> but basically, that was what I think we're supposed to believe that she was going to tell him something a little bit more profound, a little serious, a yeah. little more personal. And that's just a tiny bit of a little nugget for us to lean in and go, what? What was she going to? What was she going to say? You know, it just. Could have been anything. She could have just said, my important belongings are in a safe with the code 345. If I die, you know, give that to Wesley. Cool. But it, Or it could be, you know, I want to have your baby and call him Jack Picard and run away, you know, and come back in Picard season three. You know, we don't know. I think that's what she was about to say. <laughs> and they, they cut it off. Uh <laughs> But yeah, I thought that was great. Um, really enjoyed the scenes between them. She brings out a little different dynamic in Picard. Um, there's there's a there's a, a warming up that he does when he's just alone in a room with her, and there's just the two of them. There's a softening. There's a 
there's a real kind of vulnerability that opens up on Picard that I like. Um, and then also um, to switch pace again, there was another point in this episode, ver- words wise, where she says, these are not people. They're animals. We're dealing, they're animals we're dealing with here. Fanatics who kill with, remor- uh, with no remorse or conscience. But the idea of these are not people. They're animals. Mm-hmm. The dehumanization. I thought that's another accurate thing that we see when we get into these particular kinds of conflicts. We always see a dehumanization aspect on either one or both sides where it's like those people are not even they don't even have any you know regulator they're just not even human they're like animals and once you start to dehumanize people then then there is no you can do anything to them Mm -hmm. you know slaughter you can exterminate you can and i think that's one of the first steps uh, of a very long, steep down or uh, downward decline is when you start to dehumanize people and you don't look at them as people who have the same kinds of interests, goals, life experiences, life expecting, uh, you know, dreams, aspirations mm-hmm. as anybody else. That really is step one to destroying your enemy or convincing your people to destroy your enemy is to dehumanize your enemy. Uh, you other them, you dehumanize them. Once you can convince these people that they're not like, they're not human, they're not like us, they're not really, they're they're this or they're that. Once you do that, then anything goes. You could literally then, okay, no, no, it's just, that's always step one. And the second anybody is dehumanizing other people, that should be the biggest red flag that no, we are all humans. There is no yeah. dehumanization of any human. Uh, that's a, a very important uh, point that you bring up there. Yeah. Also, very quickly, also, there was a really long quote that I was just like, this thing feels like it hit a history book to me. Uh, like everything I ever learned in in the course of Every history class I ever took <laughs> was basically some, summed up right here when he says, uh, uh, the lady says, how much blood was spilled in the history of your federation, doctor? How many good and noble? Oh, no, no. This was uh, Flynn who yeah. says it. How much blood yeah. was spilled in the history of your federation, doctor? How much good and noble societies, how many good and noble societies have bombed civilians in war, have wiped out whole cities, and now that you enjoy the comfort that has come from their battles, their killing, you frown on my immortality. And in the finest tradition of your own great civilization, I'm willing to kill for it too. Or wait, uh, yeah. So basically what he's saying is like, look, it's easy for you to say what I'm doing is horrible because it is. But almost every race in... The the history of the world has done atrocities, and just because they've moved past it and they can now pass judgment on others, the key is, well, and they're right, I agree, but bad things are bad things, but you always have to remember that in your own history, you also did some horrible things and nobody's hands are completely clean. So I kind of butchered that quote, but it's a great one. Yeah, it was a it's, a it's a morality play because you know um, there was a moral high ground that mm-hmm. Doctor Crusher was trying to take in this particular instance, and he was trying to and he did dislodge her from that high ground and say get off that high horse because here's a mirror and we mm-hmm. can look at what you've done to get to where you are and yeah it's easy to say that now he also mentioned about one one person's. Um, you know, terrorist is another person's martyr or hero. War general. General. Yeah. So there was all of those kinds of parallels made and very accurate ones too, by the way. We keep seeing this theme play out now as as we're living. That was the biggest line. The difference between terrorists and generals is the only difference, is only the difference between winners and losers. And that's really what it is. History is written by the victors and we all know that. And that was the beginning of the quote that I mentioned yes. there. That's kind of really what raised my eyebrows because I was like, yep, that's, you win, then you paint yourself as the yeah. good guy. Uh, 
Yeah. But look, speaking of good guys, oh wait, not quite yet. Real quick, home run of the episode. What do you say? Um, I'm giving the home run to <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's it's hard. It's hard to give the home run in this episode. So actually, now that I think about it, I would say Melinda Snodgrass deserves it. Um, because I think the writing is so exceptional, mm-hmm. but performance wise, I, I, I loved, uh, Gates McFadden in this episode. I thought she was really, when she was quiet and not responding to the guy who cap, you know, captured her. I loved the, just the quietness and the, and the facial expressions I thought were amazing. And when she opened up to Picard, I thought that was, you know, I thought she just did a great job when she came into the the moment when she says, I have a son. I know. I wish that was said great. that. That I was, that like, was oh, the whole God. thing right there. Yep. That got me. So uh, I'm going to give out Melinda Snodgrass for writing and um, Gates McFadden for performance. Mm-hmm. So uh, for me, it's a, uh, I want to go with the duo of, uh, Melinda Snodgrass and Gabrielle Beaumont. Uh, great stuff all around for everything that we just mentioned. Uh, also, some great people are the following. Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Titus Muller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, the Dark Lord, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach High, Julie Manis V, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, a.k.a. Grandpa One, and of course, the one and only Jason Oaken. Stick around, everybody. Here comes the free-for-all. Wish I could do the uh, trivioids that well instead of butchering <laughs> all the names. We'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. It is time for the free for all with Melissa Longo. Yo. Ooh. We are joined by Jason M. Oaken, who knows everything about writing and directing. Uh, Eve England is out in Wales. I bet. Justin Indeed. Weir, Shag 840, with Hold his on. Chucky doll, and a cat tail. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got the Dark Lord, Chris McGee, Darmok, and Jalad at Tanagra. Wearing that shirt, that is. All right, everybody. Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. Ah. Uh-huh. I will say like um, a seven seven. Ah, uh, the George Mirasan vote. Got it. Yeah, double seven. Does anybody else have any guesses that doesn't already know? Seven one. Six point nine. Mm-hmm. What did you say, Justin? Seven two. Chris, I was actually going to guess seven two myself. So. Wow, all with within that little region. The answer, of course, is you guys are actually really close. It is six point eight. Six point eight. I was a little surprised. I expected it to be much higher than that, honestly. But maybe that's just because, you know, again, the some things age well and maybe the the rating goes up and up and up over time, or maybe it goes down or something like yeah. that. But uh, do we have any non-appearance mentions today? I mean, George Washington, but I don't think we ever see him. <laughs> right? We don't see him in Star Trek. No? Yeah. Okay. Any Not some yet. kinds of or some sort of? I didn't hear any. All right. <laughs> well... Melissa Longo, we got no non-appearance mentions, but uh, why don't you get us started off on the right track? What did you think of this episode? Excellent behind the scenes picture behind you, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I thought it was, I was reading up on this episode and um, 
thought it was fun that this is the first Star Trek episode that had both a woman director and a woman writer, Melinda Snodgrass and Gabriel Beaumont um, as the director. So that was pretty rad. Um, but to be honest, I found this episode to be exhausting. Um, not <laughs> because <laughs> not because it was a bad episode. But um, because of the subject matter it d deals with, uh, I, I think Gates McFadden, for me, um, hit the home run in this episode. I think she's fabulous. I think she's wonderful as Beverly, and, and Beverly Crusher is becoming one of my favorite characters, just because Gates is amazing. Um, but I found this exhausting because it... it parallels too many stories that we see daily daily and and the strife and fighting and violence and all of that stuff just really gets exhausting it's frustrating and and i think this episode really points out um some again star trek is really wonderful at this at pointing out or asking unanswerable questions and the question I think is how do we make it stop how do we stop the need for human beings to stop wanting to control each other all the time or oppress each other all the time or fight each other all the time the fighting is just exhausting and uh, yeah so that's what this episode kind of stoked for me I'm just I'm kind of exhausted by it all. <laughs> I, yeah. That's understood. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, good stuff from you. Uh, Jason M. Oaken has actually never been exhausted in his life. It's weird. Uh, I don't understand it. But uh, what did you think of this episode? Well, uh to, for me, in in a way, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I guess for the second week in a row, uh, you know, the show certainly aims high at these very interesting topics, and uh, I guess in in a way, you can say it it, it hits the target in the way it misses the target, uh, in, in differently perhaps than the uh, uh, than the hunted. But uh, you know, the whole subject of terrorism is is certainly you know. Uh, it, interesting and sort of a, a subject that we deal with on a, uh, almost on a daily basis in the world. It was the case in the 1980s. It certainly is the case now, maybe in a different way. And if you, if you, if you look at this, as, you know, what is, what is the show really trying to tell us? It, it goes through sort of these, these issues of terrorism and, you know, is it justified and not justified? It tries to take a balanced point of view, or at least, you know, makes a solid attempt to do it. And uh, I, you know, maybe it's my own biased view, but Sometimes when you're dealing with a subject like terrorism, maybe you do not want to take a balanced point of view, especially on uh, on the side of terrorists. And uh, uh, you can justify anything. Uh, and certainly it's been done throughout history. You know, the, the, the bad doers do it on a daily basis. You turn on the television, you, you see it all the time. But the, you know, the, the question is, are you justifying anything or can it even be justified? Should it be justified? Is it something we should, should we, you know, we should give credence to? And as years went by, I think, you know, my view of this episode is sort of my reaction to it changed. I used to be a lot higher on it than I am now. Maybe as I got older and as I got to see different things. I mean, not every situation with terrorism is alike. I mean, this certainly was a Northern Ireland uh, uh, sort of parallel when it was done. But if you look at other sort of forms of terrorism throughout the world, you can look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, which is another example, and uh, I'm not sure you, you, you can call these sort of t uh, different situations alike, and you can't treat them alike. Uh, it just creates, frankly, an uncomfortable feeling. I mean, you know, Melissa, you said it's sort of it's kind of difficult and tiring to watch. I think it, it makes me uncomfortable in a way that it certainly makes you think, but. I'm not sure what this episode is is telling me. I mean, if you want to give it high marks for taking on the subject, it certainly gets a medal for participating. It, it hits on on various different points. It even goes into the Stockholm syndrome if you want to go that way. It did, but uh, I'm not sure where it leaves me. 
I mean, in a way, having sort of the end uh, with a boy putting down his gun, it, it, it shows you what Star Trek often does, gives us sort of a hope for the future. So I'm glad it ended that way. Does it change anything? I don't know. But at least it, it, it it's consistent with, with the message of Star Trek as it should be. I think, you know, uh, and there's a lot more to say about it, and I'll save that for later. But at least visually, we're watching something that's interesting. It's, it's you know, Gabriel Beaumont did thing, you know, shot the episode pretty well. So things are moving along, and it's uh, it, it, it makes watching it a little bit easier. I think, you know, the star of this, perhaps to some degree, in addition to excellent performances in Gates, it may be one of Gates' best performances in, you know, seven, in six years that she was on the show. Uh, I think, you know, a big star of this episode is also the score. And we can talk about some of that later. But it's just, it, it strikes you immediately as uh, as you see the establishing shot of the planet. You, you get notice, you notice the music immediately and it kind of goes throughout. I'll save a lot of that for later, but it's a, it's a complicated show. It's, a, you know, it's a, uh, I'm conflicted about it and I probably will be. And, you know, that's why the score, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the IMDb score kept going down over the years as we see more and more terrorism kind of touch us because frankly in the, in the late 1980s at least people in the u.s watched it from a distance and i i don't think we can do that anymore certainly not after 9 11 right. Mm -hmm. right great stuff thanks very much jason oak and the first guy ever to mention the word score twice in one sentence with two different meanings uh <laughs> so that worked out well for us uh eve england is out in wales what did you think of this particular episode yeah, I think I had sort of similar sort of ups and downs watching this. It, it definitely felt uncomfortable in light of recent events and things that we've seen in the last 20 years. Um, yeah, and I agree. It was kind of uncomfortable. You were watching it and you kind of, I didn't really know where it was going in terms of the, the sort of narrative. And I think I was just overall, having seen the way that Deep Space Nine, for example, deals with terrorism and issues of that I think it sort of highlighted how this episode um didn't quite live up to that that you know that it's such a, as you said it's such a huge topic for them to even consider doing but it it does it sort of falls short it's a bit naive it it doesn't really go back to the roots of you know why people do what they do and I think what you just said was interesting um you know thinking of the U.S. It, at that time, you know, you hadn't really experienced terrorism, whereas, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s in the UK, you know, you were worried when you went to London because you might be bombed because, you know, the IRA was such that, you know, it was so arbitrary and so random. You just never felt safe when you went to the city as a sort of British person. Um, so I felt and what I what I what I sort of I sort of almost was quite shocked at that they mentioned or data mentions, you know, the the unification of Ireland in 2024 as an example yeah. of successful terrorism I was like hold on a second this was pretty uh, you know I don't know difficult that must have been quite difficult at the time because that kind of suggested that the IRA was you know was going to win based on what data said in terms of this future so actually I did google it then after that because I said this can't have landed that that well in the you know in in, in Britain at that time and Apparently, it wasn't shown in in its full form until two thousand and seven on the BBC. It was, it was banned that scene. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's and I because and, when I was and obviously you know it's a long time since we've had to you know really sort of had that sort of directness to Northern Ireland. Although obviously there's still repercussions today, but it, that struck me completely. It jumped out right away when I was when, when Data said that, and I thought okay, that's quite interesting. But then it's interesting watching it back on the lens of, you know, now that there's, you know, we are seeing more and more terrorism and it's much more global, that I think you do look at this episode differently to possibly how it was then, you know, perceived and pulled together based on this sort of abstract concept of, like I said, a remoteness of, of Northern Ireland that sort of America had. Um, so, yeah, so it was, I thought it was really interesting. It was an interesting topic. It didn't quite work for me, but I think the context really has sort of changed how you view it. So watching it for the first time, I obviously had all of that context, whereas, I'm, you know, it probably would have been more popular, I would suspect, originally when it came out than what people are looking at it now. Um, so that was my overall thing. I, I mean, I, I just love Picard punching that guy. I thought that was really cool. We, don't get, we need to see more of that sort of ballsy Picard. <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, Dennis Madalone was with us earlier, and he did explain a bit of that scene. He was very pleased with that, as were we. Uh, I could totally picture Eve being like, hold on a second, pause, Google. <laughs> did the IRA really win? <laughs> like, she's like, I, I'm old enough to remember that. Happen. I don't remember it happening that way. Uh, you were like one, I think. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Justin Weir is here wearing his awesome It's a Jake shirt. What did you think of this one, Justin? Hi. I'm also wearing my walking art made by Melissa hoodie. Hey, and my camp hey. keeps uh, going to town on the zipper. But <laughs> So I watched this episode three times today because I was working and I knew I was going to get off early. So I had it on in the background as I'm doing my thing. And it started off with, yes, this is a great episode because there's a lot of awesome moments. I love the action stuff, that explosion in the beginning, Picard punching the dude, Jordy jumping out of the, the phaser fi uh, fire. But then after my second or third watch, I'm like, once those themes kind of settled and I'm really thinking about the episode, I agree with Jason a lot. Um, because we really didn't, there was no really ending. Like it kind of just presented the terrorism stuff. And it gave us lots of great points, I thought. But we didn't really learn any. Nothing really was resolved at the end, except for maybe the little boy putting the gun down. But that was it. So we're kind of like, okay, we got Beverly back, but they're still going to fight on. But um, I think my favorite part of the episode was just uh, data. We see the world through an innocent boy's eyes, data, asking the questions like, he can't understand. He can't fathom how these people are doing these um, those jumps that are harming them. He's like, I don't understand how people can do that. Like, and then I also enjoyed data questioning about terrorism and Picard saying, like, these are questions that humanity has been struggling with throughout history. Um, random. I, I I was just watching the end. The kid who puts the gun down. He had a little streak of white hair, just like the the main boss guy did. Did anyone catch that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They Good detail. Did. I think they yeah, all did, was, yeah. I think Beverly was amazing. She looked beautiful, and her acting was very believable, I thought. Um, like, when he mentioned that Wes was on the ship, like, that whole breakdown. And, yeah, the score was awesome. Yeah, I don't really have much to say. I, I, I don't know if I like it or if I don't like it. It's kind of just, it's there, you know? Great stuff. Yeah. Completely understood. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Justin Weir. And, and everybody at home knows that's how you can tell they're not humans. If they have like a streak in their hair or if they wear like a purple <laughs> shirt. Oh, wait, no, it's Rock Shorts. <laughs> like green pants or something. They're like, no, they're not human. Look at their outfit. That's not a human. Anyway, Chris McGee is definitely a human and one of the best models of one we've ever known. What did you think of this episode? <laughs> Dark Lord is a model for more human for you. That's interesting <laughs> to know. Uh, well, as everyone has already said, it certainly was a different experience watching this episode today as opposed to three decades ago. Um uh, one, I'll tell you one thing in, in all my viewings of this episode in the past, something I never noticed before last night was Devo's describing the terrorists as animals so early in the episode. And that, it, I never caught it before, but that is definitely, I think, a foreshadowing how she deals with Finn in the end, just perceiving them as animals that need to be put down. Um. Also, during that same discussion, Devo said that 70 years ago, the Ansato were denied independence, which gave them a noble cause. But now that's just an excuse for more violence. She failed to elaborate, however, and Riker failed to ask if the Ansato were ever given the independence they sought. Now, according to Finn, they haven't. But maybe it's perhaps it's just another one of those matters of internal security that the Federation isn't supposed to get involved in, just like we heard about in the previous episode. Um, and as Eve mentioned, I loved seeing Picard finally get a chance to demonstrate fist negotiation. Um, 
I do have some nitpicks, but I will save them for things left unsaid. Instead, I'll close with my uh, what I think is the most memorable quote of the episode to me. It's an imperfect solution for an imperfect world. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. Reminds me of first contact. You're an imperfect being created by an imperfect being. Isn't that from first mm-hmm. contact, I think? Uh, the uh, the movie, not the episode, Eve. Eve's like, I haven't watched either. <laughs> don't care. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, right? She's like, I don't know, whatever. Uh, Jake's final take. Sirach Lofton, your final thoughts on this episode? Well, one thing was I did think that certain things rang true for me. One of them was that nobody seemed to be happy. And that seems to be the, the case. The, 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 the one side was miserable because they had living in fear of explosions and noises and they wanted to be able to walk down the street without security and the other side is miserable because they are avenging whatever grievances they feel like have been inflicted on them and i don't see happiness anywhere in this particular thing and that's what is kind of disturbing about it the other thing that jumped out to me was the quote that was used about fear being a weapon And he was like, "Uh, is that the only weapon you have, Uh, Crusher said. And he was like, no, but it's it's a good one. And it is a good one. Uh, Fear as a weapon. Um, I also thought that it was super creepy when the guy hands a bunch of pictures that he drew of her. I'm like. Uh, yes, we forgot to mention me drawing... that. <laughs> yeah, it, everybody like wants that... their terrorist captain yeah. to <laughs> draw pictures and be like, <laughs> "Yeah, here's am soft, I that bad of a guy? I've core... been drawing you yeah. this whole time." <laughs> yeah, here's some soft core uh, photos of you know hand sketches that I've been doing, and look how supple your hands are in just one look. I mean, seriously, that's not uh, a turn on for me, and it doesn't make me endear myself to you it makes me think you're a kind of a weirdo creep that's been drawing me when i'm sleeping uh so (laughs) that doesn't really work well for me um (laughs) i also wanted to say that i thought it was funny in the beginning when Riker and picard are arguing are are having this discussion about like you you gotta tell her i'm not talking to crusher no i (laughs) <laughs> I don't want to be the one. Uh, I don't want to be the one to greet her when she mm-hmm. gets here. Like they literally were fearful of, you know, overriding her decision and saying, "No, you got to come back." Uh, it was hilarious to watch them kind of go back and forth. Um, and then also, like I said, I want to agree with everybody else about Gates McFadden and her performance. I thought it was probably the best I've seen. She did so many good things. Her her silence when she was in captivity was was loud as far as her performance. And uh, the moment when she reconnects with her son at the end, I felt I felt that to be a genuine feeling of love that a mother would have, kind of like seeing that her son is okay. The way she spoke about Wesley when she said, "You know, he's got good role models," I, like, little things like that. I thought. She just kept hitting the nail on the head and, and, and delivering a very heartfelt, passionate performance without doing much on her face. It was just like very stoic. And um, I really loved that about it. Uh, and then, you know, um, I wanted to just also give a little shout out to the costume design. I, I did like um, some of those blue uniforms. They did look a little hybrid futuristic star kind of a a spin-off of some kind of a starfleet uniform to some degree so didn't they I look like liked... babylon 5 to anybody or something i don't remember it looked like, like it reminded else. me of yes. a, it reminded me of another orville. sci-fi show it yeah reminded me of orville, I thought. which one the orville oh. the orville exactly that's what i kind of thought of as well 
Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. John Elway had a theorem that they used. I know. In this, <laughs> the Elway theory for dimensional shifting. There's uh, a NAM. Yeah. <laughs> There's a NAM for yeah. John Elway. <laughs> uh, wow. But yeah, no, this this was difficult to watch. You know, it's it, it's hard to uh, you know watch this episode and 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 not have certain buttons pushed. Um, um, the lot of location kind of maybe um, diminished the score to some degree a little bit. Um, and then also the thing that rang true to me was the Federation's participation in supplying medical supplies actually did need its involvement. And so that actually rang true to me as well, as we see, you know, in real life, how these things kind of play out. So, um, very thought provoking episode. And I guess that's, you know, that's what you walk away with. If you walk away feeling these kinds of ways, talking about all these kinds of things, um, whether you agree with it, disagree with it, it still uh, ignites the thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would give Melinda Snodgrass very uh, high marks for taking on difficult subject matter and not being afraid to explore it and certainly having lines that ring true. Uh, a dead martyr is worth 10 posturing leaders. These are, these are the right. sentiments that, that somebody would have in that position. And so that's not inaccurate to me. Um, it just, it just unnerving. So um, that's my final take. Mm. great stuff uh thanks Sirac. all right that's it for us everybody god i feel like there's way more to talk about well lucky for us we got another segment right after this everybody if you are a patron of the seventh rule check Ooh. out things left unsaid right after this uh until then thank you very much to jason m oaken for joining us chris mcgee justin weir eve england melissa longo for myself Sirach, Melissa, and Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you all for hanging out with us. And until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>